Our Father, who art in heaven, blessed be your name. You have given us all things in Christ, and we give thanks to you for your great mercy and kindness to us. We confess to you our sins, which we bear as a nation. Please forgive us for our nation's ongoing meddling with and warring against other nations. Forgive us for our murdering millions of unborn babies in the name of choice. Forgive us for our fornications and sexual sins against minors and children. Forgive us for ignoring the needs of the poor and downcast. Forgive us for seeking after pleasure before your righteousness. Please change the hearts of our governmental leaders. Save them and deliver them from devilish ways and restore to them hearts of compassion. Forgive us for holding on forgiveness in our hearts and wishing evil on others. <clears throat> o Lord, our God, we do seek your face to know you and love you. Please grant us a measure of your mercy that we may not perish as a nation. But lift us up, restore us to a Christian nation where faith, liberty, and justice truly reign. Teach us again, Lord, to pray and to hold your laws and statutes and ordinances as holy and sacred. Revive us, O God, as you have our believing ancestors down through human history. We praise you and we thank you, even as we pray this prayer, that your will be done and your kingdom will come on earth as in heaven. Amen. Please be praying this prayer every day all the way to Easter. <clears throat> We've been sharing about revival. And especially since it's Lent, because this is a time for us to be revived ourselves as we approach Easter. Now, some of you may be thinking, and I'm not trying to be harsh. Yeah, I've heard all this before. Prayer and revival. <clears throat> but it's the same old religious routine. I hope not. You have this image in your mind of a circus tent and a sawdust floor and some evangelist preaching his heart out and making you feel very uncomfortable. Yeah? That's a picture of the old style evangelism, the old style revival. But when you add the fire of God to these meetings, things change as a transformation. And with the fire, the tent revival takes on a life of its own beyond mere human understanding. So the Bible is full of God's fire, and so is Christian history. And I pointed it out, forgive me for repeating it, but we need to remember that God has worked in our nation before, many times in a powerful way. He worked through Charles Finney in the early 19th century to bring about a great revival. Hundreds of thousands of people were saved. And there was D.L. Moody, whose revivals in the late part of the century after the Civil War brought about great revival among God's people. And there was a great Welsh revival where almost the whole nation of Wales was saved in this revival. And then there was the Azusa Street revival, which was dear to Margaret and I because we grew up in Los Angeles. And this revival keyed on the fire of God and the transformation of people and the coming of the Holy Spirit. And then Billy Graham began his revival ministry in 1949 after World War II and people were shook up and we were looking at this conflict with the Korean situation. Then Billy Graham began to preach and he had crusade after crusade and the 1950s were filled with revival. And then there was the charismatic revival of the late 1960s and 1970s. And these revivals all came about in a time of unrest when people were searching for God and they prayed and God sent his revival fire, hallelujah. 
The mood is captured in God's word to his people Israel. We've looked at the scripture many times. We need to implant it in our hearts. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And because we're grafted into Israel, we who are Gentiles and believers in the Lord Jesus Christ receive all the promises of God, hallelujah. And God promises us, if we seek him, turn from our wicked ways, confess that he will heal our land. And we need to claim that. We need to believe that. We are standing at the edge, I really believe, of a great revival in the White Mountains of Arizona. I can sense it. This revival fire is about to fall on us. Are we ready? You say, well, what might I do to be ready? I mean, all I am is who I am. It's like Popeye saying, I am what I am and that's all I am. <laughs> is that how we are? Or can we be more? Can we be open especially to God's moving and the revival fire that is coming? This morning, Chris gave a testimony, and his testimony was something that I would not have guessed him to say six years ago when I first met him. He said, God said it, I believe it, let's act on it. Jesus said, I go out to save you, not to become a servant of others, but not you to serve me, but me to serve you. That's the vitality of it. We're grasping at our faith, just as the church has down through the generations. It's time to believe God and stop believing the voices all around us. That's what revival needs. <clears throat> we know that it is prayer and repentance and the word of God that bring revival. All of the great revivals uh, arose out of the season of prayer and strong biblical preaching where men came under conviction and repented. And remember the principle, repentance changes the mind of God and gives him opportunity to act. When we carry around with us our unforgiveness and our sins, whatever they might be, when we have anger that we have not resolved, when we have uh, attitudes that do not contribute to life and well-being, that is a border, a wall between us and God. And that needs to be broken down for there to be a revival. Repentance is the way to revive. Now some of you, when you read this prayer that I put in the bulletin, you say, well, that's not me. I don't practice these things. But a nation does. And our nation has a lot of repentance to do, and it needs to start with us. It's like Billy Sunday, the great revivalist, told this guy who came up to him after this crusade meeting, and he said, Dr. Sunday, how can I have revival? And he went and drew a circle on the floor and told the guy to stand in it. The guy stood in and he says, pray for revival to this circle. That's where we're at. We need to be revived. It's like that song that we sang a long time ago in Sunday school. It's not the preacher, not the deacon, but it's me, oh God, standing in the need of prayer. <laughs> hey, it's us, the Church of Christ. We're the ones where the revival starts and where prayer is needed. Pray this prayer. Believe it. Add to it in the power of the Spirit. Because across our nation, this is happening over and over again in other churches and groups where people are being inspired by the Spirit to realize that they want God to act and what is needed for that to happen. You remember when Jesus was in the garden and he knew what was coming and he told his disciples, keep watch with me. And they fell asleep. And Jesus came back and said, keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Ah, oh, yes, how true. We all are pretty sleepy when it comes to revival because we're too used to life and church 
as usual. We need to wake up. That's what Jesus said to the church at Sardis. He said, you've done all these good things, but I say to you, wake up and strengthen the things that remain. What remains in your life? Faith, hope, the Bible, the idea that you can have a life through God and Christ. Strengthen that. Now is the time to strengthen it and bring about revival. You remember they woke up at Pentecost. Oh, did they? There was a sound of a mighty rushing wind that filled the house, and tongues of fire appeared and rested upon them. The revival fire fell on them. Do you believe that? Yes. It's in the word of God. It happened. And he brought about this great revival among them. And 3,000 souls were, were saved and baptized at that time. <clears throat> Revival fire is what we need. We read in the Hebrew letter, our God is a consuming fire. Let that sink in a minute. Our God is a consuming fire. What does that mean? Does it mean he's a blazing furnace of destruction? Does it mean he's an atomic weapon disintegrating everything around him? Or does it mean that he is the fire within us that anneals our hearts around him in his favor. You remember what John the Baptist prophesied, he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Amen. Have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit and with fire? Yes. Some would say, well, I'm not sure. What does that mean? It means that when we come near to God, he comes near to us. It means that when we want more of Jesus than we want of ourselves, that the Spirit can work in us and can bring about God's desire and his purpose. That's what I believe. That's what I've experienced. And we together are being called to this new level of faith and understanding. Fire is a powerful tool. It warms it refines, it purifies, it anneals, it generates energy. Physical fire does all of this. And spiritual fire accomplishes much the same thing in the human heart. What is fire? I remember the definition I learned as a firefighter taking courses to be certified. You ready? Fire is rapid oxidation resulting in combustion. <laughs> It's a good answer to put on a test, which we had. But when you sit around a campfire and you look at it, you're not saying, that's rapid oxidation resulting in combustion. <laughs> There's something about the flickering fire that sets within us a feeling of warmth, a feeling of presence, a, a mystery in itself. That's the power of the fire of God that comes down from heaven. Spiritual fire is the burning of the heart resulting in a longing for God. Do you remember Jesus appearing to the two on the road to Emmaus? The text says their eyes were prevented from recognizing him, Luke 24, 16. They related what they had heard about Jesus' resurrection and they were wondering. Doubt was creeping in. And Jesus said to them, oh foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. And Jesus taught them, and then he vanished from their sight. <clears throat> and here's what they said. Were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us? O oh Lord God, teach us your people to be renewed in your spirit and to be alive again in what you desire. There's Moses tending his father-in-law's sheep in the Midian wilderness and he sees a burning bush. He turns aside to see this strange thing. And God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here am I. 
And out of the spiritual fire of God's visible presence, Moses was inspired and called. And Moses, who had spent years in the land of Midian, just coasting, doing nothing for the Lord, much like us, turned into a prophet and led the people Israel out of captivity. Out of the holy fire, Moses became who God intended him to be. And out of the holy fire, you and I can become who God intends us to be. Do we define ourselves by what our occupation is? Many of us do. Do we define ourselves about what our social set is? Many of us do. Do we define ourselves about political parties or what church we go to? Many of us do. But we need to define ourselves about God's definition. He said to us, you are Christians and you believe in my son. And that's the commonness that we have together. It is our hope, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what the evangelist writes. That is the spark to start the fire of revival. Fire is the symbol of God's presence. Fire and its actions reflect back on the one who at the beginning said, let there be light. The heavens are declaring the glory of God writes David in the Psalms. The starry host spread out across the night sky is aflame with his light. And those thousand million stars burning in a perpetual fire are testifying to God's presence. Our God is a consuming fire. And that fire can burn in our hearts. You remember what the Bible says? We have been created in the image of God. A spiritual image, a spiritual presence. That thing within us that longs to be reunited to the eternal fire that is God. And sometimes it flares up in us and we push it down. We quench that spirit because we don't want to look foolish or we don't want to seem out of place in the culture that we find ourselves. And yet around the world right now, believers, Around the world, there are revivals taking place and people in primitive areas are experiencing the power of the Spirit because they're not prejudiced by their reasoning and by their thoughts, but they're coming to God because they're hungry for Him. And how about us? Maybe the time has come that with all this happening and people turning back to God, it's time for us to say, revive me, O Lord. Guide me. Teach me what you want for me. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Lisa gave a testimony this morning. She was walking in some darkness. It was kind of a troubling time for her. And God answered prayers, and she had light. Don't you realize that the power of God and, and light and fire is so prevalent? We can, we can be in a dark forest on a dark night and somebody a mile away can strike a match and it stands out brilliantly. That's the power of light. That's the power of the word. That's the power of God because my Bible says God is light. And our God is a consuming fire. Is his spirit burning in you? It's burning in me. And so the church has sung from the 19th century the lyrics penned by the Scottish doctor in 1863. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. 
revive us again. Dr. McKay had a godly and believing mother, but he soon turned away from Christ and the church as a young man. He says of himself, the older I grew, the more wicked I became. And finally, <clears throat> while he treated a seriously injured laborer and saw the man's faith, the doctor was convicted and his mother's prayers were answered and he came to saving faith in the Lord, glory to God. The doctor came to saving faith in the Lord and he wrote that hymn, Revive Us Again. Revive us again. Bring your spirit upon us, Lord. Cause us to stand up and to speak out and to praise you and to bring your spirit to our community and our families and everybody around us. Am I wasting your time? Have you settled yourself into a comfort zone of religious meekness? Or is the word preached in the season of unrest that hovers around us causing you to wake up and strengthen the things that remain? I pray the revival fire of God to descend upon us in every believing community on this mountain. I pray that we will humble ourselves and pray and seek the face of God and turn back to him. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Our Father in heaven, what can we say to you for you know all things? What can we do for you for you have done all for us? Lord God, how can we serve you better? Oh Lord, we pray your spirit to anoint us for a new understanding, to refire in us the faith that you gave to our fathers, that dear Lord, we may not be troubled by the day or consumed by the day in its voices, but that we would be inspired to be on fire for you. And we thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen.